<laughs> we're going to get going tonight. This is the thrilling conclusion of Ecclesiastes tonight. So we've been we've been at this for 14 weeks. We're going to wrap it up tonight. But, and let's let's start off with prayer. Great Lord, we praise you tonight. How gracious you are to give us your word, your thoughts, and your mind. Thank you, Father, for what you've revealed to us through your word. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would illumine our minds tonight to understand your truth. We pray, Father, that you would show us what you would have us to do with your word. That you don't give us your word just to know. You give us our, your word that we might obey and act. Give us grace in this tonight. Forgive us, Lord, where we have not feared you. Forgive us where we have... Uh, not heeded your word. We pray that you would cleanse our minds tonight and prepare us that we might understand and act on your word. Amen. Amen. All right. A little introduction here. Um, we're, this is where we are on our track. So we've been teaching this book as a chiasm. So it's a Hebrew poetic structure. Start, go through several messages. The main point of the book was fear God middle of the book we're now on the back side we're gonna, we've got a little more to talk about tonight about the brevity of life the urgency of life and we'll come to the conclusion tonight and close the book tonight so it this is the point and it's going to reiterate the main point of the book as we close the book also if you remember way way back in the first uh, lesson we were talking about the way the book structure. The introduction and the conclusion are called the bookends of the book. There's a lot of arguments about what you know how the book was put together and all this stuff. But people think that these these were attached to the body of the book. Uh, I'm gonna argue a little differently. I think they are attached but they reinforce the main point of the book, which is is fear of the Lord. So we'll talk about that tonight. Uh, this is kind of two lessons compressed a little bit. So we're going to finish. Uh, we'll look at the first part of chapter 12, and I call it You Can't Beat the Clock. We're going to talk about the urgency of life. And then the bottom line is where he takes us to the conclusion as we end the book. And so your homework, as you call, from last week was to be able to identify the main themes of the book. We're going to kind of go over those again before we leave tonight. The main themes of the book, and then what is your action? As God has spoken to you about his word in this book, what is your action about this, uh, what you've learned? We're going to do different. So uh, think about that tonight. All right. So we're going to start in Ecclesiastes 12. <coughs> and um, this portion, uh, again, uh, verses 1 to 8, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. It's probably one of the most familiar parts of Ecclesiastes. You've, you've heard this many times and people have preached on it. And it's a poem about aging. And, uh, you know, our themes that we've been going along here, your time on this Earth under the sun is short. Death is certain. And nobody cheats the clock. Nobody gets a pass. And so we're going to talk about aging tonight. And there's this is basically a poem about aging and the urgency to live life to the fullest. We've been talking about enjoying life. And it also is pointing us to look beyond death. It's making us think beyond death. So let's read this. Uh, chapter 12, 1 through 8. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, when you will say, I have no delight in them. Before the sun, the light, and the moon, the stars are dark, and the clouds return after the rain. In the day that the watchmen of the house tremble, and mighty men stoop, the grinding ones stand idle because they are few. Those who look through windows grow dim. And the doors on the street are shut as the sound of the grinding mill is low. And one will arise at the sound of the bird, and all the daughters of song will sing softly. 
Furthermore, men are afraid of a high place and of tares on the road. And the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags himself along and the caper berry is ineffective. For a man goes to his eternal home while mourners go about in the street. Remember him before the silver cord is broken and the golden bowl is crushed and the pitcher by the well is shattered and the wheel at the cistern is crushed. Then the earth will return to the earth as it was and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. Um, key word here in this passage is remember. He, gives, he says it twice. Um, in Deuteronomy, God warned the Israelites. He said, "When you're, you're gonna, I'm going to take you into the promised land. And over and over again in Deuteronomy, he says, remember. So when times are good and life is going good, you remember that I'm your God. And I'm the one who put you here. And I'm the one who enabled you to have what you have. Let's, let's look at that real quick. It's Deuteronomy 8. Yeah, I'm going I'm to refer uh, back to it once or twice. And I've also given you a reference for Jeremiah 3.16. Jeremiah is a call on Israel to remember God. It's a call for them to, look, to go back to obedience to the law. And over and over again in Jeremiah, he says, remember, <laughs> remember, remember. And he's calling them back to Deuteronomy. He's making this reference to Deuteronomy 8. Um, of Deuteronomy 8, 1. All the commandments I am commanding you today, you shall be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to give to your forefathers. Verse 2. And you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart whether you would keep his commandments or not. Uh, skip down to 18. But you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who has given you power to make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant, which he swore to your fathers unto this day. The key passage here is remember, and there's urgency with it. In verse 1, it says, remember God before you can't. Uh, in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no delight in him. And he goes on, and this is talking about aging. This is a poem about aging. So look how he describes aging here. Is there a way, to, is, is there any way out? <laughs> no. <laughs> there's, there's no way out of this, right? Uh, the, nobody gets a pass. It's inevitable. He talks about before the sun and the light and the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. In other words, you can't you can't see as well, right? I mean, maybe it's maybe it's your sight, but your perception of what's around you is changing. Uh, who are the watchmen of the house who tremble? Verse three. Yeah. Your hands, the watchmen of the house. Are your hands and the mighty men stoop through the mighty men. My version says the shoulders. Could be, you know, when you get a little older, you know, particularly <laughs> us guys, we don't stand up so straight. Yeah. We shrink. I'm a little shorter than I used to be. Uh, the grinding ones, who are they? <laughs> your teeth. That's your teeth. The grinding ones stand idle because they are few. <laughs> we have some advantages today with dentistry, but uh, you know, uh, a lot of people didn't have very many teeth. And those who look through the windows grow dim. Who, who are they? Your eyes. Your eyes. The doors on the street are shut as the sound of the grinding mill is low. <coughs> hearing. You're losing your hearing. And the one who will rise at the sound of a bird and all the daughters of song will sing softly. Do you sleep as well as you might have used to? No, it doesn't take much to wake you up. So the, the sound of the bird. Verse 5, men are afraid of a high place. 
I got guys painting our house right now. I'm not going back up on the roof. Uh, I've come to that threshold where I'm not going to do high work anymore. But, uh, you know, your balance, uh, your build, your, my, my cat-like reflexes are maybe not as good as they once were. Uh, uh, the almond tree blossoms. What's he talking about? Your hair. Your hair turns white. The almond tree blossoms. White blossom. <laughs> the grasshopper drags himself along. <laughs> Disabilities. Just your infirmities. Um, right? And the caper berry is ineffective. What's that talking about? Sexual desire. That's their sex drive. And, and like one commentator said, the good news is that's the last one on the list. <laughs> <laughs> So he says, for the man goes to his eternal home while mourners go about his spirit. Everybody's going to die, right? And life's going to go on when we're gone, right? Mourners are going about in the street while they're hauling you out to the to the cemetery. Life's going to go on. And so he says, remember him again, verse 6. For the silver cord is broken, the golden bowl is crushed, the pitcher by the well is shattered, and the wheel at the cistern is crushed. So we've got four, we've got four pictures of life here. This is life coming to an end. The silver bowl, the cord is broken, the golden bowl is crushed, the pitcher by the well is shattered, the wheel at the cistern is crushed. Life ends. Material life ends. That's what he's saying here. So he's saying, remember him before the end of life. Fear God before we can't. Mm -hmm. It's the urgency here. He's talking about the brevity of life. Uh, a little more about this poem here. So uh, there's multiple ways he's talking about old age here. One, uh, verse two, talks about the the moon and the stars being darkened. That's the idea of a storm coming. That's the idea of a storm coming. Uh, an old house, right? An old, a house that's not taken care of. It deteriorates. Uh, then in verse 3 and 4. And in verse 5 is the old man. All right, The grasshopper drags himself along. So there's, there's poetry here, but it's a grim reality for us. It's just the way our bodies are going to age and, and uh, not be as, as strong over time. God's word then reminds us, remember, remember, remember before it's too late. So it's, it's a call both to be saved, a call to repent, and it's a call to faithfulness uh, bef before our last day, right? So it's, it's somber, it's poetic, and it's a little bit funny, but it's very somber. So the urgency to live and act today while we can. This, this brevity of life poem here. Um, key thought here. As we've been going through this, I've made the comment several times. The preacher has always got Genesis in the back of his mind. He's always looking at this absurdity and vanity of life that wasn't there back in Genesis 1. This brokenness and absurdity and vanity of all the stuff going on around us. Because he's looking back at when man was created, when Adam was created out of the dust of the ground. One of the things we talked about early in the book is this idea of cycles. This idea of cycles. So he touches on this, verse uh, 7 here. Then when life ends, verse 6, then the dust will return to the earth as it was. All right, Adam came out of the dust, was made out of the dust of the ground. And the spirit will return to God who gave it. So there's a, a, a cycle, a completion of the cycle. And, and eight, you know, you know it's all, I think he's almost wanting to cry, right? You know, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn. So, Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. We think about the shortness of our life, the brevity of our life, 
and that one day we're all going to return to dust, even as our spirit goes to God. But the vanity of it is that that wasn't the original plan. No, that wasn't right. the plan. In the in, you know, in the mourning over the cost of sin, I think is what he's doing there in verse eight. Vanity of vanity, absurdity of absurdity, of all the foolishness that has gone on because of sin. And that's why we have to die physically. All right, so that's a fast flyover of, of uh, what, what the original lesson was here. We're going to move on to the rest. Any, any thoughts as we move on? Verse 8, mine says, meaningless, meaningless. Says the teacher, everything is meaningless. Yeah, we've talked, we've talked about this word. Uh, you may not have been here the first lesson. We talked about this word can be interpreted multiple ways. Uh, meaningless, vain, absurd. Here's life, and life has to come to an end, and our bodies return to the dust. And that wasn't the way God planned it from the original. I think that's that's the, the meaninglessness of it is the cause of sin. Anybody else? Uh, I'm sure your other versions probably have used different words. Okay. First, my mom's best friend of 65 years just passed into eternity yesterday, and um, you know I think about when we were with my children when it was. When I was overdue pregnancy with them, I just would have done everything and anything to get them out. I'm like, I was ready to go through whatever pain to give birth to them. But I think with the aging process, because we were not meant to live in the sinful, in the sinful state, it gets us to the point where we are ready to return to God and we're not afraid to. You know, um, Charlotte said to my mom the last two Thursdays that we visited her, I'm ready to go. I'm ready. And so when we start diminishing our abilities, it makes us long for heaven more. That's kind of what verse one's talking about. I, I have no delight in you. This mm -hmm. idea that you can get to the point where um, life holds nothing. Not much to life here. Yeah. yeah. Particularly if you're in physical <clears throat> pain, right? Yep. Well, that's what he's saying. There's an aging process coming. Remember God now. Act now before you have dementia. Act now before you can't respond uh, to the call of the Holy Spirit to come to Christ. Act now to to live to live with urgency and joy like we've been talking about. Do they know how old Solomon was when he wrote this? Well, he died in seventy. Now we don't know for sure that Solomon wrote this. The, the preacher takes on the persona of Solomon that we've talked about as we've gone along here. But uh, you would think he's probably later in life whoever wrote this because he understands uh, what age is about in verse 2. Yep. Or oh, he's observed it. He's, yeah. Yep. I watched a young woman doing something today that was easy for her, and I wanted to say, someday you're going to be just like me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I already think thoughts like that. <laughs> your, your time's coming. Yep, your time's coming. All right, well, let's let's scoot ahead now. Now we're going to come to the thrilling conclusion. Thrilling conclusion here. So the bottom line, uh, we're going to start in verse 9. And um, it, I want again, I want you to think about Adam. And he's calling on us to do what Adam was supposed to. In addition to being a wise man, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, and he pondered and searched out and arranged many proverbs. Thanks, Solomon. The preacher sought to find delightful words and to write words of truth correctly. The words of wise men are like goads, sharp pointed sticks, and masters of these collections are like well-driven nails. They are given by one shepherd. But beyond this, my son, be warned, the writing of many books is endless, and excessive devotion to books is wearying to the body. The conclusion, verse 13, 
when all has been heard, is fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. Verse 14, for God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or evil. All right, so one of the, one of the reasons the Ecclesiastes was accepted in the canon so quickly was this admonition here uh, to fear God because it, it reinforced the main message of the Torah, the main message of, of back, that we saw back in Deuteronomy of the, of the, of the, of the Pentateuch, to fear, live in the fear of the Lord. So um, back in verse 9 now, so in addition, notice how he's changing his tone. I, I told you that this book has a lot of different genres in it. And that's part of the confusion of how to interpret it. He's going to shift now to the third person. Okay. In addition to being a wise man, the preacher, apparently talking about himself, this is where some of the arguments come that this is a different voice, a different author now that appended the, the, the book. But don't you talk in the third person once in a while about yourself? Okay. I mean, it's, it's fair game, right? So, he's, But there's a shift here now, the third person. In addition to being a wise man, the preacher also taught the people knowledge and he pondered and searched out and arranged many proverbs. Who do we think of as the author of the book of Proverbs? Solomon. Solomon, Solomon. okay. Mm -hmm. So he's, intent, he's reinforcing the idea that the preacher is associated. If he isn't Solomon, he's somebody who knows everything Solomon wrote. He was very... And we've seen, I've tried to show you as we've gone through the book, over and over again, he refers to the Proverbs. Over and over again, he refers to the Psalms, the wisdom literature in Scripture. Now look at what he says about Scripture. It's searched out and arranged that God has arranged his book. That uh, through men, he has arranged the order of Scripture that we have. Now, I, you know, a lot of discussion about how you know our, our Bible came to be our Bible, but by the Holy Spirit, He has protected and arranged our Scripture in a specific way. Verse ten: The preacher sought to find delightful words and to write words of truth correctly. <coughs> Where can you get literature like this? When you talk about dead flies ruining the perfume, it was two lessons ago. Where can you get a book that talks about the snake behind the wall you're going to break through, or the hole you're going to, you got to watch out to not fall in? Uh, so he, what the proverbs, and that's why he, I think he's used them here. Those word pictures stick in your mind, right? Jesus used this in his parables, right? He talks about the wise men building built on the rock and the fool built on the sand. Well. You got a picture in your head, right? So God gives us these word pictures to help us remember his word. And the words of wise men are like goats, all right? You got any people around animals? Ever use a hot shot on a cow? You got the batteries, you give them a little electric shock, get them to go where they're supposed to go. Well, in these days they use goats. These goads. The, the, the most famous place in scripture that talks about goads is uh, Shamgar back in uh, Judges 3.31 supposedly killed 600 Philistines with a, with an ox goad. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's a pole that's sharp on the end. And sometimes they put metal tips on the end of them. Right? To poke the animals, get them to go where they want them to go. That's how the Holy Spirit uses God's word. It's kind of like the ball bat. You know, he talks about the ball bat, okay? Doesn't God poke you with his word? There are days where I have trouble. I have to take a deep breath before I read because I know the Holy Spirit's going to be poking on me about something. Doesn't he poke you? You told Paul that he kicked against the goats. Yeah. Why are you kicking against the goats, right? I'm trying to get you there and you're resisting. Yeah. So God's word is like a sharp stick. 
And thank you, Holy Spirit, that he pokes us. Right? Hopefully not in the eye. Amen. Hopefully not in the eye. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But um, we're given these goads to get us to do things, right? So that's why I wanted you to do your, you know, your little homework exercise of what are you going to do about this book when you walk out of here tonight. We'll talk about that. So it should prompt us to faith and obedience, and, and that's how God convicts us of unbelief and disobedience. Now notice in verse 11, they are given, the words of wise men, scripture, are given by one shepherd. Well, in the Old Testament, who's in the Psalms, what's the most famous psalm about the shepherd? Psalm 21, the Lord is my shepherd. That's who he's talking about. The Lord has given us these things. He has given us his word to heed because it's sharp. Over in the New Testament, right, it's like a sharp sword, sword that cleaves uh, into our heart. Um, so the Lord has given us his word here, and it has purpose. And that's to convict us and guide us. Now, I like this one, verse 12. But beyond this, my son, be warned, the writing of many books is endless and excessive devotion to books is weary to the body. Amen to that one uh, about the excessive books. But the point of that is, is flip back over to James 1, 22, back in the New Testament. But James talked about this. He said a little more bluntly than what the, the preacher just did. But prove your, uh, let's see, I'm going to start 22. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he's looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, which we've been doing for 14 weeks, the law of liberty and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, he just told us twice tonight to remember, but an effectual doer, this man shall be blessed in what he does. So at the end of the book, he said, you know, hope you enjoyed reading the book, but you've got to act on this book. This book wasn't given to you just for your curiosity. It's God giving you a poke. It's giving you a poke. And what are you going to do in obedience to the word of God? You, now that you've heard it. Um, all right, so the big conclusion here is 13. And the whole point of the book, you know, people, people sometimes interpret this book as, well, the preacher was trying to find his purpose in life, right? And we saw how he chased women and he built buildings and he did all these things and he said he saw and he searched out and everything. It's, it's not supposedly about finding purpose in it's, it's kind of like asking the wrong question. The purpose of the book is to get you to fear God. Purpose comes from fearing God. Purpose in life comes from fearing God. But the main purpose that the, the preacher's been after the whole book is to tell us to fear God. So that means this short life under the sun has more to it than just death. There's more after death because, verse 14, for God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it's good or evil. So you can chase whatever you want to chase. You know, that's what, that's what he said last week. You know, young man, you know, pursue life. I'm, I'm paraphrasing uh, from last week. But remember that everything you do is going to be, you're going to be accountable for it. That gives us purpose. Right? Think about situations where people aren't accountable for stuff. Right? Um, if you don't have to clean up after yourself, what kind of, isn't there a tendency to be kind of messy? Okay? Think about how you live your life in that respect. If you know you're going to be accountable, you're going to want to live clean. You're going to want to live holy. 
you're going to want to live in the fear of the Lord because you know you're going to be held accountable for it. <laughs> that's, that's the thing that the preacher was talking about in the early part of the book. Men live and don't find any purpose because they don't have any, they don't have any fear of God or any account, sense of accountability after they die. Here he's saying, life is short, death is certain, and you're going to face accountability. Fear the Lord. Fear the Lord. Mm -hmm. no. do, you, do you mind if I kind of throw in a comment? Here? Sure, please. A lot of surveys of Americans in general, 70, 80 percent will say, you know, they are Christian, you know, but then, of course, you know, it's like you go through there by like, how many of you really seriously take take the word of God seriously, only like less than one percent of that, you know, take it seriously. <clears throat> it just comes to show like, you know, sometimes in our society we're too comfortable. You know, sometimes comfort is a dead thing. Comfort everything is exactly what you want it. You know, like the Yeah, well well, well for the one of the earlier lessons he we're cautioned about that and he tells us better to be in a house of mourning than in a house of feasting. Yeah. You know, better to face the reality of death than to live it up, right? But it kind of gets to your point. But he, you know, that's, that's one of the things that he's talked about as we, as we walked away through the books that you write. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, again, back in Proverbs, what, what did he tell us back in Proverbs 1-7? Verse 1. Pretty well-known verse. What's what's the one seven? Proverbs oh, one seven. Anybody got that one? Fear the fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Mm -hmm. Okay, so see how oops, see how where it gets to in Ecclesiastes ties back to Proverbs. Yeah. The whole basis of wise living is the fear of the Lord. That's that's where it all starts. That's what we've been telling them. Mm -hmm. um, I gave you some references here where he's pounded on this as we march through the book. Uh, Ecclesiastes 3, Ecclesiastes 5, 7, and 8. Uh, also, um, again, I want to tie you back to Deuteronomy, where is it at? 10. And we know this scripture from the New Testament most of the time. It's back in the Old Testament, too. Deuteronomy 10, 12. There you go. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you but to fear the Lord, your God, to walk in all of his ways, and to love him, and to serve your Lord, the Lord your God, with all of your heart and with all of your soul, and to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which I'm commanding you today for your good. And what did Jesus say was the first commandment? Love your Lord, your God, and your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. And then the second one is to love your neighbor as yourself. So it all, this whole point of fear in the Lord, it ties back to Deuteronomy. It connects with the, the, the commands of Jesus in the New Testament here. Um, so the idea here is to live in light of God's future judgment. Um, there's no testing out. You know, the, some classes you might have had, you know, you didn't have to take the whole class. You could take a little test, and if you could pass that, you got credit for the class. There's no testing out when it comes to standing before the Lord and being accountable. Uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 5. And, the, and Solomon, has, or the preacher, has talked about this over and over again, that everything he's talked about applies to all men everybody uh first corinthians 4 5 therefore do not go on passing judgments before the time but wait until the lord comes who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness and disclose the motives of men's hearts then each man's praise will come to him from the lord in other words everybody's everybody's going to be accountable is the point nobody gets to opt out nobody escapes uh, nothing's hidden, complete knowledge, and only God can do that because he has complete knowledge. 
2 Corinthians 5.10, kind of the same idea. Get there. And uh, Revelation uh, 20, of course, also. But uh, 2 Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, for that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body, whether to what he has done, whether good or bad. And then uh, giving you the reference here in Revelation 20, and that's where everybody stands before the Lord and God, the books are open that it talks about. So, and Solomon's talked about this, that every deed counts. Every deed counts. So faithfulness in little things. And he, he's talked about judgment, but remember judgment is not just discipline, it's rewards. You know, and that's one of the emphasis in the New Testament. We are going to be rewarded for acts of faithfulness. You're going to be rewarded for faithfulness. And we, we talked about it last week, the parable of the talents, right? The, the, the stewards who were good with the talents that God gave them and invested it, they were rewarded for it. So when he says, fear the Lord, every act will be brought to judgment. Remember, that includes rewards. It's not just... That's not simply punishment. It's rewards also. Faithfulness and little things. So that's how he ends the book. That's, that's what we've got to here. You know, this was the big message in the middle of the book. He's talked about it. He's gotten more practical as we got to the end of the book. And he punches it again here and tells us, the main thing I want you to know walking away from all this this whole exploration of, of, of this world, absurd world under the sun, is fear of the Lord. We're going to be accountable after death. So here's your test. Here's your test section now. So what are the themes of the book? What were the themes of the book as we march through this? I've given you a little chart to help you. <laughs> Our cheat sheet, right? This is your cheat we sheet. We got it out. I, I gave you this in week one. Thought I'd bring you back to it. Okay. Okay. Utility of life. Okay. The certainty of death. Okay. Nobody escapes. Life is uncertain. And manage risks. That was part of that. I thought that was good. Yeah, know the seasons. It's part of wisdom. Part of God's wisdom is know the seasons. To be able to apply wisdom in the seasons. So manage risk. Okay, what else? Enjoy your life. Okay. Today. The good times roll. Let the, let the good times roll. There you go. There you go. Paul, Paul isn't here tonight. He's our party guy. <laughs> He's probably on a cruise. Yeah. That's right. He's enjoying the salt life. Yeah. <laughs> you emphasize that one too much. Okay. Enjoy life today. God I'm is sovereign. And it's one of the things, I just want to throw this little nugget in that we talked about, that includes seize the moment, right? Mm -hmm. Seize the opportunities that God puts in front of you. Okay? God is sovereign. Uh, how did the preacher talk about that? Sometimes we don't know why things are happening. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Talk, well, he talked about it a couple of ways. You know, at first the book he talks about his sovereignty over creation. Creation is doing its thing. It has these cycles that God has established. He's, he's sovereign over the times and the seasons. There's a time to be born. There's a time to die. There's a time to weep. There's a time to right. laugh. And he's sovereign over, over justice. Right? I see the righteous man dying young, and I see the, uh, the evil man dying old. 
God is sovereign over this. And that I can't, we can't see how God's going to use these things in the future. And we don't know how God used things in the past for now. <laughs> so all, all that was part of, of God's sovereignty. Another section uh, I wasn't going to take to that. Read Romans 9. There's a passage in Romans 9 that talks about God's sovereignty to say who he's going to raise up and who he's going to put down. Anything else? Any other big themes that you took away from the book? I'm missing one. Fear God. Fear God. That goes over to God. Come here. Yeah. Another one. We won't be judged. Uh, okay. Uh, judgment. Okay. And maybe we we kind of talked about it here, but life is short, right? And something about balance. Yeah. Uh, that kind of goes with this one, this idea of keeping balance. He talked about how the race doesn't necessarily go to the swiftest. The, yeah. the, the guy who works all the hours isn't necessarily going to get the promotion. And he talked about keeping balance in life. Uh, it, um, I have to go back and look exactly where that is at. Probably about chapter 8, thereabouts, somewhere in there. Anything else you took away from the book? I had pleasure here as temporal and income. Okay. That. Okay. It's yeah, it's limited, right? Mm -hmm. You go one time on a trip and you think, well, you can go back and it's only just as great, but it never is. Right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The restaurant you went to and had uh -huh. a great meal, and you go back and it's not. Get attacked by a rooster. <laughs> Get attacked by a rooster. Right. Well, was a child. Um, is it yeah. one, one of the things that goes, touches on this one, is we talked about that God gives us things to enjoy as a gift. Mm -hmm. That these are God's gifts. Uh, the things that we're given um, to enjoy. And we're supposed to be satisfied. Mm -hmm. yeah, yes. Contentment. Yeah. With our life with the, with the work that God gives us, with our lot. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, we each have a lot in life ordained by God, right? Okay. Anything else that's impressed you? Sally, the one you said about the do you think that means that they don't satisfy? I mean, that they... Yeah, they're incomplete. Yeah, yeah. Like we never satisfy. Yeah. Yeah, because are we getting ever have... Enough. Enough. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> she, did, um, she must be having trouble with their yard. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody want to share what their action, you know, what did God poke you with? What's your action item for what, out of this study of Ecclesiastes? What are you going to do about it? What do you want to share that? Well, I'm usually a pretty quiet person. Well, don't be denied. There's <laughs> <laughs> some lady sitting down by me today, and she's introduced herself. I thought, so I told her to meet Pastor Jason. I would have used to do that. I've never talked to him in my life, you know. Oh. <laughs> okay. Season the moment. Season the moment. Okay. Okay. Anybody else? Things that God's impressed you with to do. Be generous. Be generous. That's that's been on my mind this whole uh, spring. Uh, is being more, learning to be more generous, and, and maybe more spontaneous, more urgent. Uh, thank you.
enjoy every day yeah. to the fullest because we don't know what tomorrow might bring. Yep. Tomorrow. Mm-hmm. But enjoy it. Enjoy every day to the fullest. Yep. It's the little things in life that bring you the most pleasure. It's just little things mm-hmm. of kindness or and, and something being like content with, yes. uh, with the little things. You know, mm-hmm. kind word. You know, we talked to. Talk, he talked about controlling your, your mouth, controlling your tongue, right? So being using it generously, if you will. Okay. For me, for me uh, uh, meditating and diving into the sovereignty of God, you know, because it, it just, it's very enriching. Uh, you know, I think for me to, to study scriptures that uh, talk about God's sovereignty, uh, because, you know, I mean, it's like the, the changes that happen in my life as it reflects who I am and bring the mess. And so it's like when God's in control. Okay. Yeah, very good. I think only what's said for God is for the best. Mm-hmm. You know, either I don't feel that I fear God. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. I don't think I've ever feared him. Mm-hmm. I don't know why. Not like Frank. It needs to be in awe or like reverence. Respect. Well, you have to reverence God, right? To reverence God, right? You fear your daddy. You respect your daddy. That kind of fear. Both fear and respect. Sally, man. I have just been convicted to finish well. Yes. Finish well. Especially as you age, um, yeah, that not to ever quit or stop or retire, but that every every bit of your life counts. And that's important to finish well. Yep. She just blew a mind for me. <laughs> that was yours, Marion? Uh, no, I want to quit. I want to quit. <laughs> <laughs> You're never going to quit. You're just, I, I she's going to I'm, prayer, I'm prayerfully praying that God will mature me as a Christian. And in the uncertainty of life, I will grow and move from uncertainty and move from that to uh, by grooming, by growing in. Uh, assurance and conviction, and know that God is in control. Yeah. And they are, I'm going to have uncertainties every day in my life because we live in this fallen world. Mm-hmm. But we have to know. And as Sally said, when you get to our age, you look back and you think. Lord, that's, you know, I've wasted a lot of my life. I want to finish strong for him. And uh, that's, that's all we can all at this age, I think, and be attuned to what God would have us to do and do it. And act. And act. Yeah. Leave a legacy. And put, leave a legacy. Put your, put your bread on the waters. Take action. You know, you know the pastor kind of touched on that tonight you know if you read this book at face value right you just want to go up on a building and jump off right (laughs) the world is vain everything is vain there's no righteousness there's injustice everywhere there's oppression everywhere and the pastor talked about this tonight this idea of god's people being living in faith that's all it said this book's a call to faith living in faith that God's sovereign and God is in control of what's going on. Even when five minutes on the news will tell you it it doesn't look that way, right? Mm -hmm. But God's people acting in faith with these principles, fearing God and living with pleasure and living with contentment in the middle of, of, of a crazy world under the sun. That's kind of the upshot of the book. And with the help of my lovely assistant, we wanted to help you guys enjoy life a little bit. So we thought some chocolate was in order.
think that when you think of Ecclesiastes, you can think of how sweet life is. So everybody gets to pick what your, your favorite. There's milk chocolate, there's dark chocolate. Okay. What are you? Oh, that, yeah, that looks, that's fine. Okay, milk chocolate. Yeah. So anyway, Thank life you. is sweet. Thank you. Yeah. Life is sweet. Like, I, I need this. Enjoy <laughs> it. Yeah, right. Seize the day. Yep. There you go. <laughs> No, a command. Given as a command. Give us permission. We don't have to. They don't have to be a monk. Yes. Thank you all for the hand. <laughs> The, before we close out, before you get in trouble, does anybody need notes from any of the weeks? Does anybody need any notes previously? Wow, no. I don't know you lost first week. I think you lost them now. Oh, oh, oh. oh. what's the guy missed there? I have, I have the schedule from my let me, let me close this down. All right, everybody got the chocolate? All right. All right, so we want you to enjoy life as you walk out of here. Let's, let's close in prayer. We'll, we'll close with a, a word of prayer. Great Lord, we praise you for your word tonight. How good you are that you call us to trust you, to trust you through things that we don't understand and can't understand. And we praise you for our past, our present, and our future. Thank you for your goodness in Christ. Thank you for these things. In Christ's name, amen. 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 amen.